Awesome. Hello. We'll get started in about four minutes. In the meantime, let's see what's happening in the news. The FBI is still looking for people. I forgot how many arrests they've done so far. Pacific Hackers is doing a special event, Hacking Multi-Factor Authentication, on February 27. The Internet Storm Center put out a diary on Word Docs hacking. Hack Miami is doing a WhatsApp signal telegram attack vectors. Ooh. Shodun has an updated CLI. If you haven't used Shodun before, you should. Oh, there's a Sysmon room and try hack me now. That's good. Some good stuff happening. Oh, thanks. We try. It's 11. So let's get started. Oh, let me pull out the folder where Zoom will save all the videos. That way I have that ready. Cool. All right. Hello and welcome to CIS 77 the Digital Forensics class at Cabrillo College. My name is Irvin Lemos. I will be your professor for the next 16 weeks. This course is all about introduction into the world of digital forensics and incident response, or as I like the tagline, I see the leader files. There are a number of links that you should be familiar with already. 
For all Cabrillo College students, your Canvas shell will be accessed at this link. For everybody else who is not a Cabrillo College student but listening in, you can see the full class at this site. Everybody should be on Discord. And all the recordings for all the all my classes are available as playlists on YouTube. And I know I have this ugly link for now, but I'm sure with time that'll change and I'll get a much better link. I want to make uh, extremely clear that Discord plays a very vital role in your grades. Last semester, a number of students didn't chat as much as they should have, and their grades ended up dropping a whole letter grade at the end. Uh, there is a bot called StatBot who is watching all the, the chatter that's happening on that server, on the Discord server. At the end of the course, I will see the graph of everyone's, uh, everyone's activity, and then it will be graded accordingly. So I want to make extremely clear that collaboration for this course is essential, and Discord is your easy go-to place. If you haven't been able to join the Discord server, send me a message after class and I'll help you get the right role and get all that sorted out. But uh, yeah, I, I don't want it to be a surprise later that you you weren't so uh, you weren't so collaborative and then you your grade drops a whole letter at the end. The course has a very simple structure as simple as I could make it for you. Uh, every module has a, a lecture section. All my speaking notes are there. If I forget something or if uh, you wanted to catch a, some a specific thing that I said, it those, set, those lecture uh, pages are all my notes pu publicly available for you to see. The lab section has your work for, the, uh, for that specific week. Uh, modules one through eight have a lab section. Then uh, then modules nine through 14, I believe. Yes, nine through 14 don't. While at this time, at the time of this recording, I am not actually done putting, inputting all of my notes for the entire course, I actually have no problem in sharing what that looks like. So again, modules one through eight will look very similar to this, where you have your, your lecture notes for you to see, and that's exactly what I'm reading off of every week. You have your uh, lab work that you'll do every week and your review that's tied to the lecture notes. Once we hit module nine, after spring break, things will change a bit. As you notice, there is no lab. We're, we're gonna have our overview as always, we have the lecture notes and we have the review. The reason why I took out any lab work for modules nine through 14 is because you will have these cases down at the bottom to work on. Uh, I have sorted them in small versus large cases as a class you will be able to work on these cases. Uh, this is your final, is these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven assignments. I don't expect you to, uh, to do this on your own. I expect you to work together because these are pretty, even though it's a small case, it's not really a very simple small case. It will take work to do and uh, digital forensics investigators don't work alone. So in that same spirit, your class together will work on these cases and submit them. And you'll have until the end of the semester to submit these. So once they're ready, you will see them on Canvas. For now, they are hidden because I haven't fully uh, finished writing them out, but they'll be up soon. Here we are.
Now a note about the due dates, and this is specifically for Cabrillo College students. All of the, the labs, everything that you have to do has a due date on it that you'll see here. This date uh, is to keep help you keep on track. Now I understand that life happens and you may not be able to turn in everything on time. That's perfectly fine. As long as you turn everything in before the due until date, which is May 18, 1159 PM, you are able to submit anything that you have late without any penalty. Because again, I understand life happens. So when it does, don't panic over this course. Handle whatever situation you're in and then come back and finish up the work. You have until May 18, 11.59 p.m. to turn in any and all assignments of the course. After that day and time, no work will be accepted. Um, I see a question in the chat. Should we start on the cases now and work on them throughout the semester? I the, the, uh, the cases in the second half of the semester aren't live, so you won't be able to see them. Uh, and that's for good reason, number one, because we need to go through some content and some understanding before you start hitting them. Uh, but number two, I also am not, am not full, fully finished writing them all out. But once they are live, it will be up to you and your, and your classmates to decide when you're gonna start handling which ones. Any other questions about how this course will run for the next 16 weeks. Any Canvas questions, any Discord questions? Yeah, I say 16 weeks now, but blink twice and, and we'll be reaching summer. Any questions about the, the format of the course, the assignments, Discord? Cool. Then I will stop this recording. Make a quick video. Yeah, I expect you to work together. This, this is one of those classes where working together is, is encouraged, required, recommended, all of the above. You should not be doing this by yourself. Especially, you know, there's no reason to work on it by yourself. Come on now. Uh, take this video, put it on YouTube, CIS 77 orientation. That's processing and that'll be up in a bit.
So a question like that, uh, making a time to get together, that is something to discuss and vote on through Discord. It has the functionality where you can type in there and put reactions and, and do all that. That's why you have that platform to use. Awesome. Then with that done, let's move on into the lecture. I don't expect these classes to go all the way to two o'clock. The lectures tend to be pretty short. So at most, I think we'll be spending an hour and we'll be out by noon. Okay, let's dive into the lecture. So, digital forensics, the retrieval, analysis, and use of digital evidence in a civil or a criminal investigation involves any medium that can store digital files and the digital files themselves. This field is a science because of the accepted practices used for acquiring and examining evidence and its admissibility in court. In other words, we're not just taking stuff and blowing it up like we would if it was, uh, if it was ethical hacking. We actually have to have a method to what we're doing. We have to have reason for it because the mindset is whatever we're doing has to be admissible in the court. It has to be able to be used as evidence in the court of law. A forensics means suitable for a court of law. Therefore, the digital evidence is, re is retrieved, handled and analyzed in a sound manner. Another way is evidence has to be in its original state and anyone in contact with it has to be accounted for and documented. Computer forensics can yield incriminating evidence or prove a defendant innocent in criminal cases. Very important that we do what, everything we're gonna do in this course falls in that uh, specific standards uh, for examining our evidence. Couple myths, forensics is not the same as computer security. Security is a proactive, preventing crime from occurring. Forensics is reactive. It happens after a crime has been committed. Forensics is not just about investigating computers themselves. It's also any medium so things like cell phones, USB drives, infotainment center on cars, IOT devices, and so on, are all, all fall under computer forensics. Computer forensics is about investigating computer crime. This field within cybersecurity is equally important in things like murder, embezzlement, corporate espionage, not just computer crime. Computer forensics is really used to resurrect deleted files. Our primary focus is to retrieve and analyze files using scientific methodologies that is acceptable in a court of law. We'll go well beyond retrieving files into things like search, filtering, password cracking, and decryption capabilities. For example, some types of digital forensic evidence that we will be recovering, email. Establishing control, ownership, and intent. 
These three are critical in making the evidence incriminating. Sometimes email is the most personal as they can show the intent of a suspect of a suspect or victim. In case regarding child pornography, the defendant commonly claims he or she was unaware of the images. The prosecution must prove that the defendant knew of their existence and that the pictures were of minors. Email evidence can show the suspect's images were shared, helping prove the suspect's guilt and possible to prosecute. Hashing can verify the image from one computer is the same on another. Chain of events. Email, email contains a chain of conversation, including times, dates, email sender and recipient, making it possible to reconstruct the events that led up to the crime being committed. Prevalence. Email is important because of its heavy use in work, personal, and business communications. Endurance. Defined as the concealment, destruction, alteration, or falsification of evidence. This is a serious crime carrying a felony charge in many states. Email is valuable because it is generally accessible from other systems and not solely the client. Email services can be served a subpoena or a search warrant to turn over email files stored. Email is also accessible on other devices like tablets and cell phones. It is admissible. Courts have accepted email, including printouts, as evidence and accessibility. Email is not necessarily subject to a search warrant. Under the Stored Communications Act, stored communications like email less than 180 days old require law enforcement to obtain a warrant. The EFF has been fighting the government to change this law. Another type of evidence recovered is images. All the various types that exist like BM, uh, BMP, JPEG, TIFF, PNG, and more, images are especially important in child exploitation cases. They contain metadata detailing the camera used, proving ownership, the GPS data, file creation, modification and last access dates, and so much more. Video. This evidence can be found on various devices from computers, digital cameras, and cell phones. Surveillance video is mostly stored on computers and falls under this domain. For example, surveillance video can be critical to the successful capture of a criminal who inserts a skimmer, like the one shown here, on ATM machines. Closed circuit TV is the use of video transmitted to a particular location. Computer forensic investigators have a variety of forensic tools to choose from, providing stills at predetermined points, enhancing the quality of video and more. These tools can help identify important incriminating evidence without the need to watch the whole video, allowing the investigator to not be subjected to watching disturbing content. In the courtroom, video evidence can be the most compelling type of evidence for a jury to convict a criminal. Continuing our list, websites visited and internet searches. Most investigators agree that a live system should be examined while on as evidentiary files and data related to internet searches and websites are more readily available within RAM. And also uh, they tend to be unencrypted while in RAM. There's also cell phone forensics. Mobile forensics is growing exponentially. A cell phone can tell you who the suspect knows through their contacts, any appointments through their calendar, who the suspect has been speaking to, call history, and, and talking with through text, 
along with image and video evidence, places visited with GPS, online purchases, and websites visited. Cell phones are a true treasure trove of information. And of course, we also have Internet of Things, being cognizant about these new devices like home thermostats, surveillance, lighting, uh, infotainment centers on cars, and their digital trails saved locally or in the cloud is part of our investigations nowadays. So what skills should you possess? Well, you should have information technology knowledge, a strong foundation of operating systems and file systems will allow investigators to know where files are stored and determine their value to prosecutors. OS knowledge provides an understanding of how hard hardware and software interact with one another. Knowing the effects of certain features like BitLocker, Lux, FileVault would lead an investigator to keep the computer on. The examiner must have extensive investigative abilities using digital evidence to demonstrate control, ownership, and intent, such as proving a suspect was in control of a computer when the files were stored in memory, proving ownership by the credentials, proving intent that a website was accessed multiple times or an image viewed on a number of occasions and subsequently distributed to others. Knowledge of Linux is useful to clone volumes, Android examinations, application analysis and networking. You could also use even uh, things like Apple scripts and whatnot to uh, scrape websites for brute forcing pins on a Mac. Python can be useful in automating website scraping and PowerShell commandlets can retrieve information from Windows. Now I will say the extensive investigative abilities are things that we are gonna cultivate in this course. The technical knowledge from like uh, operating systems, networking, security, that you should be coming along with and we will help refresh and refine those, those tools and knowledge in this course. So I won't be covering how Linux works. I'm assuming you have an understanding of how Linux works and how to use the terminal, but we'll definitely dive deeper into using various tools within the operating systems. Legal expertise. Knowledge of the law is important, along with many other things. Gaining access to a suspect's computer may be the first challenge. If a suspect's computer is at their home, the Fourth Amendment, search and seizure, is imperative. A judge must be convinced that a crime has been committed and there's reasonable expectation that key evidence exists at a particular location. Law enforcement must show pro a probable cause or reasonable cause to believe that a crime has been committed. We're gonna spend, uh, I believe, an entire module talking on the law. So don't feel that you have to have legal expertise right now. Communication skills. Writing skills are not to be underestimated. This is why we have so many classes in English and writing. Investigators must document the process and findings in such a way that technical experts can comprehend the findings. Moreover, the investigator will have to effectively communicate their findings to a judge or jury who have limited knowledge of computers and forensics. You will be doing a lot of report writing in this course. Um, and from a student point of view, I know that sentence brings a shudder to your spine let me tell you, it is not as bad as it is. Being a student myself, I hate reports. 
but the reports in forensics are not as bad. It's not, you don't have to write every single word, every single line and, and double space and all this, all that shenanigans. We will get to that and I'll explain what, what it looks like. It's, it's not as bad. So don't, don't freak out that we do, that we will be doing reports in this class because I myself will be the first to say, I hate writing 30 page reports and we're not writing 30 page reports. Um, linguistic abilities. With the growth of international cybercrime, the need for uh, multilingual forensics investigators has grown. There's continuous learning. An effective investigator is always learning new skills, such as technical skills, uh, psychology, and more. And of course, an appreciation for confidentiality. Keeping informa information confidential is imperative. Only those who need to know about investigation should know. The fewer, the better. If a suspect finds out, you risk the suspect fleeing and also risk exploitation of evidence, like hiding, altering, destruction of evidence. Leaks to media are also a concern. Lastly, I wrote a, a quick little history of digital forensics that I don't expect you to know like the back of your hand because this isn't necessarily a history class. We will be covering a number of the bills and laws that are talked about in that history later on. And really having, having an understanding of what the, the laws say will be enough to get the conversation started. We're not, we're not training here to be lawyers. So I don't expect you to know the law and all the little minutiae of them. But as long as you understand simple things, like for example, when I say HIPAA, you should automatically think healthcare. You know, that's, that will be, that'll be enough. Being able to, to have quick associations in your mind where this law talks about this. So you have, you know, that's, that's plenty because your focus really will be on the, the technical aspects and writing those reports to provide to lawyers for the cases. Any questions on the content? Looking around, looking around. I see no questions. Cool. Let me share this. So this week you have a module one review which is a simple 10 questions based off of the content we just covered. And there is a cloud setup. As of right now, I haven't received the Google credit from uh, Google, but you can already get started. If you, have, uh, if you still have credit from last semester, you can still use it. Um, if you don't, you can get started with $300 credit from Google Cloud. I suggest using a uh, either using an account, a Google account you don't use primarily or make a new dummy account for yourself to sign up for this, just because when the $300 run out, then they'll want to, to charge you and it's best to, before it runs out to close that account and continue on with a different account. It's very easy and straightforward 
to uh, to get started. And if you get stuck at any point, you have Discord to ask for help. I would not use your Cabrillo account. I would I would suggest to use a dummy account. You'll create a Windows virtual machine. Uh, uh, you'll use server 19 data center with desktop experience and you'll get all the way into the uh, the desktop. You'll also create a Linux VM and uh, and log into that. Once you are done with that, and the, the reason why I have you make the Windows and Linux VMs are to make sure that you are able to navigate GCP and be able to spin up VMs. Because with, with that account that you have already made two VMs with, you will make these three. FireEye's Flare VM, which is based off of Windows. The SIFT workstation, which is based off of Ubuntu 16. And Scotty, which can run on Debian or Ubuntu, or actually it works on anything. So that could be your choice. For Flare VM, you'll need to run uh, the install.ps1, this uh, PowerShell script. I will let you know now that Flare VM takes forever and a day to install and configure. For whatever reason, this takes a while to get ready. So if I were you, I would start this up before you go to sleep and come back in the morning when it should be done. SIFT workstation takes about 20 minutes or so to install. You have the instructions right here. Oh, that's to download Ubuntu. You won't need that because in the cloud, you already have those. So you'll move on straight to step two to uh, install what you need, run sudo sift install to get all the latest versions. And then you have your, your logins and you're good to go. In my opinion, Scotty is the easiest of them all. If you use the Docker instructions, that takes about 10 minutes or so to download, install, and configure. When it's all done, you'll be present, you'll go to the web to the IP address, the public IP address of your system. And you'll log in and you'll have a portal like this. And you'll have all kinds of tools at your disposal ready to go. And here's some examples of the tools that already that will be presented to you once you have it all configured. So this week is all about building up the infrastructure that will become your cloud lab for digital forensics. Again, if you get stuck at any point, you have Discord to ask for help and anyone from the TAs and, and each other and myself are there to help you out uh, with the process. Once you are all done making your, your three VMs, you'll just submit proof. And that can be as simple as a screenshot of here's my installation of FireEye's Flare VM. Here's my successful installation of SanSift. And here's my successful installation of Scotty. Nothing too crazy, just submitting proof that it's all done. Any questions? I advise against having it all in one because of the way that these are all configured. So SIFT workstation is very much like your Kali Linux of 
digital forensics. So it's going to have a certain configuration and everything done a certain way and it's running on Ubuntu 16 and whatnot. I would not mix this with Scotty. I would have them as two separate systems. Now you are more than welcome to try it. I am not going to stop you from uh, you experimenting. Maybe it'll work. I wouldn't do it because I like to keep things organized, but that is just my own personal opinion. You, you will have, you know, you have your own cloud instance, so you can do whatever you want. Maybe it'll work. And if it works, you should tell us. And if not, that too. Other questions? The snapshots in GCP should be within Compute Engine. Let me log into mine. Give me one second. Oops. Uh... Here they are under storage snapshots. If there are no other questions, I will stop the stream and recording.